right, folks, welcome to the workshop. Welcome to another Hickory Hacker video. This week I'm doing something a little bit different. I'm actually headed on vacation for the first time in two years with my wife. We're going down to Puerto Rico. So I didn't have enough time to pull together the course vlog video for this week, but I did have an opportunity here to show you what I picked up at the Columbus Golf Collectibles Trade Show, January 7th and 8th. Um, it was a lot of fun, obviously, uh, kind of dicey coming back home through an ice storm, but I made it fine. And uh, I wanted to show you some of the things that I picked up. I, actually, I'll just show you quick all of the things that I picked up here um, at the show. Uh, we'll start with this over here. Um, if you follow my Instagram page, you saw me post a picture of this guy. Um, actually, I think it was probably, yeah, it was this one. Um, this is a Santee mold made by Bruce Marquardt in Michigan. Uh, he used a few different woods here to make these, and there's different sizes, but this, the concept is pretty simple. It's got a plunger with a spring and a rounded wooden piece in there. You just take this and dive it in wet sand, and then just eject your sand team mold, and it's got a little dimple in there because of this plunger. Um, each of these basically makes a different height sand tee, and um, either different height or width. Uh, I like mine to be pretty close to the ground, so this is probably the one that I'll use because it makes a sand tee that's probably only about that tall, but it's about that wide. Um, so that'll be a cool one for me. Uh, this one's made out of ebony, and as it looks like, it's, a, it's got a longer or taller profile to it, and this makes a taller tee as well, uh, but it's not as wide as this one. Um, so got a few different sizes here. You know, I figured after I bought the first one, I may as well acquire a few more because I figured people would ask me where I got the one I'm using and I uh, thought it would be a good chance to be able to sell some of Bruce's stuff. So I traded Bruce uh, a, a golf club for four tees and um, picked up another one too. Uh, and uh, I've got a couple people in mind already that I'm going to give these to, but uh, the rest of them I'm going to sell whenever I'm out and about. Um, well, I'm going to keep one for myself, obviously, but uh, you know, I'll sell the others whenever somebody asks me what I'm using. And I'll, I'll probably end up asking Bruce, uh, you know, if he can make some more in the future, because I'm sure I'm going to get more questions about these than I'm going to have Santee molds to sell. So there's those. Let's move on to balls. Um, so the only thing that I really had in mind to buy at this trade show was a Bramble ball. It's, um, I have a lot of balls yet to, to find. Uh, but I don't have any brambles. So Bryant Murphy, who runs an uh, antique booth, a great golf memorabilia in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, at the Lake Geneva Antique Mall, uh, he's become a good friend of mine, and um, I bought this bramble off of him. This is a St. Mongo, and um, he remembered it being a St. Mongo remade, uh, though when we looked at the, the wording, we couldn't quite figure out where it said remade, um, but from Brian's understanding, uh, this would have been a ball that St. Mongo would have collected, damaged, and would have remolded and then sold again. So it's still of the era, probably circa 1910, uh, very clear bramble design on it. Uh, so it suits the purpose that I wanted it for, which is um, a bramble. Uh, and uh, also, bonus, you can read the company that made it. Uh, so that was cool. And then, you know, couldn't just have one, apparently. So uh, there's another collector at the show who had this bramble, a little bit different, different pattern on it. Um, this one's in pretty good condition, uh, though it's discolored because according to the person I bought this from, it was actually retrieved from a pond. So that accounts for the discoloration of it. But everything else on it is pretty good if not a little bit worn from just being in water for a long time, but this is a chemical popular and um, just really cool brambles, bramble designs all the way around it. Yeah, just a few cuts, um, but this will look nice too, right next to the uh, St. Mongo. Uh, a couple last things to show you for balls. Uh, this is an interesting thing. Um, I bought this from Bruce Marquardt. It's made out of wool and it's got a knitting pattern here and apparently people collect these because there's always you know usually different knitting patterns on them but this was a wool practice ball um, from the 1930s so that's kind of cool and then another practice aid here that i picked up sorry about the heat noise um, it's connecticut and it's going to be 13 degrees tomorrow so <laughs> the heat's working over overtime now um, see if i can open this up this is a putting aid that was made in england in the 50s 
and uh, I got this from Bruce Marquardt, and uh, according to him, they're pretty collectible um, outside of the United States. Uh, they made these in three designs, or three sizes rather, and the sizes were determined by this rib in the middle that you needed to try to keep the, uh, the, the aid rolling true on. And uh, this was the smallest of the three. So if I get good with this, I'm gonna be pretty good with uh, putting in general. Um, but I'm excited to try this and, and try not to bang it up too much because I, I realize it's got some collectible value as well. All right, so those are the balls. Let's move on to the clubs. Show you, I only picked up three clubs and um, you know, which is kind of rare for me, but I don't really need anything right now. Um, I just kind of wait for things to jump out at me at this point. And uh, this was one that did jump out. Um, Bryant Murphy had this and um, I actually picked this up before the show, uh, the day before the show. Uh, but this is a BGI, um, technically probably a mashie. Um, it's got a similar head shape to the Canon Taylor mashie from the same era. Uh, but BGI um, is the Bridgeport gun implement company and they made golf clubs from 1898 to 1904. So this is one of the few companies that's post 1900 that the National Hickory uh, Championship allows you to use their clubs. Um, and I think it's probably because uh, even though they're turn of the century it's up to 1904, uh, BGI made their clubs in the old design, um, old Scottish design and uh, hadn't quite transitioned yet into the, the more modern head shapes that uh, companies were starting to use to accommodate the new Haskell ball, which came out right after uh, 1900. So these are still really good players with gutties um, and easier to find and usually pretty affordable. Uh, if you're looking to build a set, a new gutty set, I definitely recommend you look for BGI clubs because you're, you're going to find good players and uh, you're going to be able to build your set affordably. Uh, that said, the tricky part of building any gutty set um, is finding a, a small headed niblick. Um, you know, notice I said small head niblick and not rut niblick because rut niblick is actually an earlier club uh, prior to 1890s. Um, small headed niblicks um, were what people were using in the 1890s into 1900s, more similar to the niblicks that we know in modern hickory uh, clubs. Uh, but the purpose of them was the same as the rut niblick, and that was to get you out of a pretty tough lie. Um, still, though, the small-headed niblick was a pretty specific club for that purpose, and it was hard to use for anything else. So what I like to tell people is, uh, if you can find a small-headed niblick for your set, that's fantastic. But if you can't, don't worry about it, because if you can find a BGI club, or any club for that matter, that's got some weight to it, and is 40 degrees to 45 degrees, you're still going to be able to extract your ball from tough lies like you would with a small head niblick, but you're also going to have more versatility because you can use this club for, um, you know, chip shots around the green. Um, you could even use it for full swings if it's not too heavy. Um, I'm not sure I would do that with this one. This is a G0 on the swing weight scale, so this is heavy. Um, but uh, yeah, at 46 degrees, that's exactly what it's going to do for me, and it caps a set that I've, um, that I've been building. Uh, and actually, I'll just give you a little bit more history on BGI. So when you look at a BGI club, pretty much all you'll see is the stamp here that has BGI Bridgeport, Connecticut. Uh, but then there's usually a stamp on the hosel, either on the back or the front here. And uh, it, this, it, the stamp is basically a W inside a diamond. What that signifies is the J.H. Williams Company, which, according to Pete Georgity, is probably the first company in America to forge irons. So uh, the J.H. Williams Company forged the irons for BGI and also made their own clubs, and this, this is one of theirs. Uh, this is a cleek, 17 degree cleek, uh, with a Carruthers hosel, so the shaft actually goes into the hosel here and then comes out the top of the head. This is a patented design um, in the mid 1890s, I believe, uh, but it's signified by this really short hosel here. Um, uh, but yeah, this is a J.H. Williams clique, and you can clearly see the J.H. Williams um, symbol here, and then the W inside the diamond. Uh, this, this club is 17 degrees and is C9, so uh, it's going to be a good player for me. This is the lowest lofted club in the set that I just finished by putting this 46 degree BGI in. So I was excited to find that. Um, moving on. Uh, so before I was collecting, well, 
it, it shouldn't come as any surprise that I've always been collecting something. So I used to collect baseball memorabilia, and one of the things that I really wanted to pick up was uh, tobacco cards from the 1920s and earlier. Uh, but as you know, uh, those are probably the most expensive and hardest things to find in any baseball card collection. Uh, but the cool thing is, in golf, they made tobacco cards as well, but the demand for those is far lower, so they're a lot more affordable. Well, my friend Tim Robinson gave me these reprints on Friday at the show, and uh, these are just reprints of a uh, cigarette company. Actually, this is a pipe tobacco company in uh, England that made these cards, but uh, they're just kind of funny golf related, you know, tobacco cards. So Tim gave these to me and these are cool. But then uh, I talked to another collector and uh, found myself pretty jealous of the situation that he was in, where he was able to acquire three tobacco cards, uh, one of which was a, I want to say 19, late 1920s, early 1930s Walter Hagen. Uh, that was very cool. And then a, another card that I'm going to show you here in a second. And uh, the second I saw it, I was trying to scheme as to how I could get that card from this collector. So I made him an offer the next day, and he thought about it, and then came back to me and said, your offer is pretty good, but I also would like a club. So we ended up trading cash in a club for the card I'm about to show you, and I uh, was very excited to pick this up. This is a 1923 Coke Brothers Harry Varden Kenilworth cigarette card. It's already been graded by PSA. It actually graded very good, uh, but there's because of, there's a crease here in the top of the card, that you can barely see, it's black and white, so it doesn't affect the display at all. Um, but I'm really excited. Harry Varden's one of my personal golf heroes, and I've always wanted a cigarette card, especially of Harry Varden. So the opportunity uh, arose, and I was able to take advantage of it. Um, just really cool. I like how PSA slabs these cards, obviously, so you can see both sides clearly. Uh, but I would like to display this in a frame that kind of cuts this part off so you just see wood around this part. So I'm going to see if I can find that, or if not, you know, maybe take it to a frame shop and see if they can make me something. Uh, but I'd like a frame that goes all the way around it, but that I can still see the back too. Um, so the plan for this is to put it on display in my little golf museum over there, and I'll show it to you when it's up there. Um, one last thing to show you there, tobacco card related. Um, just to kind of, you know, demonstrate how affordable tobacco cards are right now, uh, for golf, these cards each cost three dollars a piece, and they're really cool. This is a Park Drive cigarette card made by Gallagher in, in London, uh, 1933. Uh, this particular card is Honorable Michael Scott, who won the British Amateur in 1933 at the age of 55. So I actually think this year is probably from 1934. These cards were made somewhere about, but uh, two different conditions of the same card, and uh, I'll figure out a way to display those at some point as well. Uh, finally, last thing to show you, Golf History of New England, a really cool book that Bruce Marquardt gave me um, because he knew I'm up here. And uh, yeah, I, I just started paging through this and I'm already seeing a lot of stuff that I think is really interesting. Um, you know, being up here in New England, a lot of the golf clubs that uh, circulate have some relation to a pro that was up here. And uh, I was really excited to open the page to Mike Brady. Uh, I've collected a couple of his clubs over the last year, uh, sold a couple, but um, I have one right now actually, it's a, Nick, a George Nickel Nashy with his name on it, and uh, Brady made, made a name for himself by coming uh, in second to Walter Hagen in the 1919 U.S. Open, that actually went to a playoff, and Hagen was so impressed by uh, Brady's play that he asked him to get a pro at one of his clubs in Michigan. So Brady did that, and then moved on to become the pro at Wingfoot in the mid-20s, late-20s, something like that. So uh, I come across Mike Brady's clubs quite a bit, and uh, he's kind of become one of the favorite pros that I look for clubs uh, that were made for. Um, so anyway, that wraps up what I picked up at the Columbus uh, Golf Collectors Trade Show. Um, you can pick this stuff up, too, if you keep an eye on the Golf Heritage Society website. Uh, right now, the next big show on the books is the National Convention in September, which is in Indianapolis, and I believe it's September 20th to 24th. But there is some talk of there being another show in the Northeast. And then there's regional shows here and there that uh, usually are associated with Hickory Hacker events. Uh, not me, Hickory Hacker, but just you know, general uh, informal Hickory Play uh, events. 
And um, you should definitely keep an eye on the schedule at the Golf Heritage Society website um, because you need to come to these shows. If you've got any interest at all in Hickory Golf Clubs or golf memorabilia, you're going to find something that you want and you're probably going to walk away a collector of something that you didn't even plan on collecting before you went, which is not a bad thing because this stuff is just really cool and we need more people taking care of it and um, either using it if it's a club or displaying it and just increase, increasing the appreciation for golf history. So that'll do it this week. Thanks for watching. I'll be back next week with another course vlog, hopefully tanned and ready to go and give you uh, more course vlog videos. Uh, but between now and then, I'm going to be sitting on the beach relaxing. So thanks for watching. I'll see you next week. Please like and subscribe.